The Red Necklace by Sally Gardner Read by Tom Hiddleston This is Paris. Here the winds of change are blowing whispering their discontent into the very hearts of her citizens. A Paris waiting for the first slow turn of a wheel that will bring with it a revolution the like of which Europe has never known. In the coming year, the people will be called upon to play their part in the tearing down of the Bastille, in the destruction of the old regime, in the stopping of the clocks. This is where the devil goes walking looking with interest in at the window of Dr. Guillotin, who works night and day to perfect the humane killing machine, sharpening his angled blade on the innocent necks of sheep. Little does the earnest doctor know that his new design will be centre stage, a bloody altarpiece in the drama that is about to unfold. But wait, not so fast. King Louis the Sixteenth and his queen Marie Antoinette is still outside Paris, at Versailles. This is the winter of 1789, one of the worst in living memory. Jack Frost has dug his fingers deep into the heart of this frozen city, so that it looks almost unrecognizable under its thick blanket of snow. All still appears as it should be. All has yet to break. Here, then, is where our story starts, in a run-down theatre on the Rue du Temple, with a boy called Jan Margosa, who was born with a gift for knowing what people were thinking and an uncanny ability to throw his voice. Jan had a sharp, intelligent face, olive skin, a mop of jet-black hair and eyes dark as midnight, with two stars shining in them. For the past few months the theatre had been home to Jan, his friend and mentor, the dwarf, Tetu, and Topolin, the magician. Together they travelled all over France, performing. Without ever appearing on stage, Tetu could move objects at will like a sorcerer, while Topolin fronted the show and did tricks of his own. Jan was fourteen now, and still didn't understand how Tetu did it, even though he had helped behind the scenes since he was small. Tetu's age was anyone's guess and, as he would say, no one's business. He compensated for his size and his strange, high-pitched voice with a fierce intelligence. He could speak many languages, but would not say where he came from. It had been Tattoo's idea to invest their savings in the making of the wooden hero. The result had been a sensation. Monsieur Olar, Manager of the Théâtre du Temple had taken them on and for the past four months they had played to full houses. In these dark times, it struck Monsieur Ola as nothing short of a miracle. The Pierrot had caught people's imaginations. Some thought that it was controlled by magic. More practical minds wondered if it was a clockwork automaton or if there was something hidden inside. This theory was soon dismissed as every night Topola would invite a member of the audience on stage to look for himself. All who saw it were agreed that it was made from solid wood. Even if it had been hollow, there was no space inside for anyone to hide. Yet not only could the Piero walk and talk, it could also, as Topola told the astonished audience every night, see into the heart of every man and woman there and know their darkest secrets. For the grand finale, Topolin would perform the trick he was best known for, the magic bullet. He would ask a member of the audience to come up on stage and fire a pistol at him. To much rolling of drums, he would catch the bullet in his hand, proclaiming that he had drunk from the cup of everlasting life. After seeing what he could do with the automaton, the audience did not doubt him. Maybe such a great magician as this could indeed trick the Grim Reaper. 
Every evening, after the final curtain had fallen and the applause had died away, Jan would remove the small table on which had been placed the pistol and the bullet. Tonight the stage felt bitterly cold. Jan peered out into the darkened auditorium. He could have sworn he heard someone whispering in the shadows. Hello? he called. You all right? asked Didier the caretaker, walking onto the stage. He was a giant of a man with a vacant, moon-like face. I thought I heard someone in the stalls, said Jan. Didier stood by the proscenium arch and glared menacingly into the gloom. There's no one there. More than likely it's a rat. Don't worry, I'll get the blighter. He disappeared into the wings, humming as he went. Jan felt strangely uneasy. The sooner he was gone from here, the better, he thought to himself. There! The whispering was louder this time. Who's there? shouted Jan. Then he heard a woman's soft voice whispering to him in Romany, the language he and Tattoo spoke privately together. He nearly jumped out of his skin, for it felt as if she was standing right next to him. She was saying, The devil's own is on your trail. Run.